In these videos, we present a technique for proving that certain languages are not context-free. Recall that in week 5, we introduced the pumping lemma for showing that certain languages are not regular. It involved the division of suitable strings into three parts, x, y, and z, and then repeating the middle part, y, any number of times. There is an analogous lemma for context-free languages involving the division of strings into five parts, u, v, x, y, and z, and then repeating the second and fourth parts, v and y, together any number of times. More formally, if A is any context-free language, then there is a number p, the pumping length, where if S is any string in A of length at least the pumping length, then S may be divided into five pieces, u, v, x, y, and z, satisfying three conditions that are stated here. As you can see, the lemma is analogous to the one for regular languages, but with the strings having five parts instead of three, as captured by condition number one. Condition two says that either v or y is not the empty string, otherwise the theorem would be trivially true. And condition three states that the pieces v, x, and y together have length at most p. We know, for example, that our favorite context-free language, 0n, 1n, can be pumped in this way. Supposing the pumping length to be 2, then all strings of length at least 2 can be pumped indefinitely. Here, we can choose v to be 0 and y to be 1, and the other three substrings to be empty. No matter how many times v and y are pumped, the resulting strings will be in the language. The idea of the proof of the pumping lemma is as follows. Let A be a context-free language. We must show that any sufficiently long string in A can be pumped and remain in A. So let S be a very long string in A. Then it must have a long derivation in a CFG and hence a parse tree. This parse tree must contain some sufficiently long path from the start variable T to one of the terminal symbols at a leaf. On this long path, some variable symbol R must repeat because of the pigeonhole principle, as the following figure shows. This repetition allows us to replace the subtree under the second occurrence of R with the subtree under the first occurrence of R, and still get a legal parse tree. Therefore, we may cut S into five pieces, U, V, X, Y, Z, and we may repeat the second and fourth pieces and obtain a string still in the language. Now let's turn to the details of the proof. Consider a generic CFG and let n be the maximum number of symbols in the right hand side of any rule in this CFG. In any parse tree using the grammar, we know that a node can have no more than n children. So a tree of height h has at least, has at most n to the power h nodes and hence the length of the string generated is at most n to the power h. Say v is the number of variables in this CFG. If there are v plus 1 variables in any branch of the parse tree, then one variable is bound to repeat according to the pigeonhole principle. So we will set the pumping length to be n to the power v plus 1. Now a string of that pumping length will need to have a parse tree that is at least v plus 1 high. To see how to pump any such string s, we look at its parse tree. We know that the tree must be at least v plus 1 high, so its longest path from the root to a leaf has at least v plus 1, has a length at least v plus 1. That path has at least v plus 2 nodes. One of them is a terminal, the others are variables. Hence that path has at least v plus 1 variables and one of those variables has to repeat. We divide s into u, v, x, y, and z. Each occurrence of r has a subtree under it generating a part of the string s. The upper occurrence of r has a larger subtree and generates v, x, y, whereas the lower occurrence generates just x with a smaller subtree. Both of these subtrees are generated by the same variable so we may substitute one for the other and still obtain a valid parse tree. Replacing the smaller with the larger repeatedly gives parse trees for the pumped strings where i is greater than 1. 
and replacing the larger by the smaller generates the string uxz where the value of i is 0. That establishes condition 1 of the lemma. Conditions 2 and 3 add some necessary constraints on the problem and you are encouraged to read about how to weave them into the proof from the Sipser book.